Welcome to Peter Day's World of Business. And in this programme, the subject is intangible, invisible and of rapidly growing importance. Peter Day has been getting to grips with something in the news, intellectual property. Hello and welcome to Global Business. It's not often you actually witness intellectual property in action, apart from that C in a circle that's a global symbol for copyright. But this is one such occasion, a conference of academics and business people at the University of Coventry in the English Midlands, organised by the British Government's Intellectual Property Office. Gary Townley of the IPO told me what's happening here. Most people have heard the terminology, intellectual property. They may know they own some, but they're not quite sure what it is. But really, it's a collective term for a bundle of rights that businesses create in their everyday going about what they do. What are you doing here? Raising the profile of intellectual property in general? Absolutely. That's our role. We're not selling. We want to make businesses be aware of what intellectual property is and make informed decisions. And you think there's still a lot of ignorance out there in business, do you? We do numerous surveys. The last one about two months ago, 96%, I think, came back, don't know the value of their intellectual property rights. 96%? This is serious businesses? Absolutely. Yep. You ask people who are in this seminar today, what's your brand worth? And I bet they couldn't put a figure on it. A lot of business out there is going to be probably 90% of their business is tied up in intellectual property. But they're unaware of it, and they couldn't put a value on it. And they don't have a strategy for managing it. And that is why we come out to do these things, because people need to be aware of these, and they really do need to make best use of them. That's crucial to any business, really. Despite all this uncertainty, copyright is in the news everywhere as the digital world collides with print and film and broadcasting with what you might call the analogue world. Mark Anderson is the chief executive of the internet technology newsletter Strategic News Service, and he takes a close interest in the way intellectual property is being influenced by network technology. On the line from Seattle, he told me about his big concerns for the way intellectual property is under attack in cyberspace, something making daily news headlines. He describes it as a war in which professional internet hackers are carrying out an unceasing series of raids on the vital secrets of countries and of companies. There are about 150 in the last 150 days, so you could start with Google, which was the most famous in the most recent series of threats. And by the way, Peter, these are all called advanced persistent threats which for your audience is different from having a Russian botnet take credit cards out of a bank. This is where you have a team of very highly skilled people who know how to enter a network in a foreign country uh, quietly without being detected, look around for the right file in the right directory out of thousands and thousands of directories, and then find that file, remove it, clean up behind themselves, and never be caught. Now, it sounds a bit paranoid. After all, people have always tried to steal trade secrets. Why are you not paranoid about this? Why is this suddenly so important? Is it real? I guess would be the right question, and I think it is real. number of APTs has tripled this year. It's a logarithmic growth curve over the last, say, three years. The number of victims who have come public are increasing rapidly. Beginning with Google, we now know that Google was hit, Juniper Networks was hit, Adobe was hit. We just found out that Intel has been hit, Lockheed has been hit. Almost all of our security firms have also been hit, including RSA, a division of EMC. And the keys from that company, which are used by about 50,000 corporations worldwide, now appear to belong to those who made the attack. And Lockheed is saying that maybe that was how they got attacked. There is a very well-orchestrated series of increasingly frequent attacks happening on what looked like very carefully chosen targets. And that puts the spotlight firmly on intellectual property and its value to a corporation and to a country. And you say it's underestimated. Imagine that you wanted to create a new aerospace sector in a country that didn't have it, and all you're missing is the jet engine design. What is it worth to you to get that design? And what does it mean to you if you don't get it and you have to wait 20 years to enter that market? If you have to wait 20 years to enter that market, you have to take not just the value of the jet engine, but the value of the entire aerospace industry you were trying to create and being out of that industry globally for 20 years as the missed opportunity value of not stealing that stuff or of not getting it. So intellectual property becomes, with this perspective, not just one of the assets of a company or a corporation or a country, 
but the overwhelming asset of that place. Absolutely. The crown jewels of any given technology-driven enterprise are essentially the price of its existence. And if those are stolen, they can expect to see competition coming back at them on a global market scale at half price in short order. Mark Anderson, the founder of SNS Strategic News Service. Copyright, intellectual property, patents, they're all about the rights of writers, musicians, inventors to protect and benefit from the things they've created. Copyright has been evolving ever since the invention of the printing press in the 15th century in Europe. Patents came alongside it. But every new technology has an impact on the way copyright works or does not work. The new digital era makes copying or stealing other people's property easier than ever before, very much easier. And, as Mark Anderson told us, companies are putting their crown jewels in danger of theft via the Internet all over the place. At the same time, a huge new digital economy is being created out of the Internet, search, e-commerce and social networking. So, far from being an obscure playground for publishers and lawyers, copyright is now becoming a bit of a battleground. In Britain, there have been four inquiries into aspects of intellectual property in the past six years. In 2006, the former editor of the newspaper The Financial Times, Andrew Gowers, produced an official report on intellectual property in the light of the digital revolution. He told me what he'd been trying to do. Intellectual property is sometimes mischaracterized as equivalent to physical property. It's not. Ideas are replicatable. And the question is, to what extent do you protect and incentivize creation on the one hand, and on the other hand, enable creation on the back of other creation? It's wonderfully stated, isn't it, in the American Constitution, the right of the author or creator to benefit for a limited time period from his or her created work, plus somewhere else in another clause, the right of the commons, the people to benefit from the eventual transmission of this into common usage in order to innovate upon it. And that's very strongly stated in the Constitution. Uh, It's wonderfully clear, as many things are in the American Constitution, and I think one of the reasons why it was felt necessary to have a look at the whole thing again in my review, was there is no such clear statement in British law. In fact, what you note in looking at the whole of intellectual property law and regulation in this country and in many other countries besides is it's a patchwork quilt developed in a very ad hoc way over the years. My job was to try and produce a policy rationale fit for the modern world. More later from Andrew Gowers. At the heart of the intellectual property argument is a vital tension between the right of the creator to benefit from his or her creation or idea and the creativity released when others are allowed to use those original ideas to build innovations upon them. That's the big argument, but here's an example of how significant it can be for even a small company to protect its intellectual property. John Nunn runs a business based near the university in Coventry called Tortrix, employing three people busy creating software for business clients. John Nunn came to the Coventry conference to learn more about how to protect his company's vital work after a recent bad experience. About a year ago we were looking to try and raise some funds to build our own solution. We spoke to a couple of uh, venture capital companies and some government organisations and one person we spoke to recommended speaking to a hospital he knew who might be able to help and we agreed for him to speak to them on our behalf. This was uh, was getting another client, was it? It was actually our own idea, our own solution that we were trying to develop and he then went and spoke to this other hospital but unfortunately there was no non-disclosure agreement in place. They took our idea and released it to market before we were able to. That's uh, sharp practice, to say the least. It is, but unfortunately, as everybody says, all's fair in love, war and business. And you weren't protected, you hadn't got copyright. We hadn't got copyright because the solution hadn't been developed. We couldn't gain a patent on our idea because it was completely software-based. And we unfortunately, in that instance, didn't have an NDA in place between ourselves and the third party. Why are you here? We're trying to learn more about intellectual property and how we can protect our ideas and prevent ourselves from getting burnt again. John Nunn of Tortrix. Also at the conference was the lawyer Mark Yeadon, a specialist in intellectual property. 
In his eyes, protecting your ideas is absolutely at the heart of any 21st century business. Intellectual property, it is a property right. It is a right that has value. It can be bought, it can be sold, you can take out a mortgage on it. And absolutely, when a company is moving into a new technology area, they will try and get the broadest possible protection so they can lock out their competitors. Increasingly, companies are looking for that competitive edge and investing heavily in the development of new technology. Pretty much the only way to really protect that technology is through the intellectual property system, filing patent applications, procuring the patent and then defending it if need be. You can't patent stuff that other people have already nearly got, can you? No, absolutely. The two main criteria, it must be new. In other words, nothing identical anywhere else in the world before you filed. It must also be uh, inventive, not an obvious development of something which is already known. But it's a very valuable tension between the rights of the patent holder to benefit from the patent and the common rights of people, the innovation rights, to build on these inventions. That's how innovation happens, and that's getting more and more important in the economy, isn't it? Absolutely. The patent system is a quid pro quo. In exchange for a company making a public disclosure of its invention, in order to encourage innovation and and exchange of knowledge, the government offers the 20-year monopoly on those rights. Innovation, I think, historically has always thrived where you have people communicating and sharing of ideas. It's becoming a fascinating area of tension between communicating and therefore accelerating the development of technology and protecting the ideas that are arising and ownership where ownership is due. Mark Eden, one of a small band of British lawyers specialising in intellectual property. This is Global Business from the BBC. I'm Peter Day, hearing about the pressures on invisible things such as copyright and patents, ideas. Now to Professor Ian Hargreaves, a man whose career has, you might say, been centred around intellectual property. He's been a newspaper editor in Britain, and for a time he was my boss, Director of News and Current Affairs at the BBC. He's now moved with the Times into a job called Professor of Digital Economy at Cardiff University in Wales. The British government asked Ian Hargreaves to continue the work the Gowers Report did on intellectual property to bring the law further into the digital age and examine the links between IP, growth and innovation. He told me just how far the principles of copyright extend into our everyday life and how often we infringe them. Breaking of the law is a daily affair as people transfer their CD files into their laptop files, into their iPod files. And every time you do it, you kind of endorse the fact that it's a law that's a bit silly, don't you? Yes, it's clearly not where you want to be. And of course, very quickly we get to these big philosophical cyberspace philosophers saying all information wants to be free. Do you have any sort of time to think about that when you're compiling a report on copyright? Well, you can't help but think about it. But that's not primarily what we're on about. This is a review about the economic implications of the intellectual property arrangements, not the moral and philosophical implications of those arrangements. And the argument here, which the Prime Minister kicked off in the way that he introduced the review, was to talk about the way the American system works around a rather flexible concept of a fair use exception to copyright, whereas in Europe, we have a more rigidly defined stack of specific exceptions to copyright, and that's one of the differences we've been debating. Well, the Hargreaves report has just proposed various changes to the law in Britain and various principles to be applied to copyright as technology changes on the internet inevitably make an impact, perhaps an assault, on traditional ideas about intellectual property. Clearly, not every issue involved in the history of copyright is economic in intent, but I think it's a perfectly valid way of putting the question to say, let's ask ourselves how all of this is interacting in a modern economy where intellectual property is becoming more and more important. 
this is a much reviewed subject and one of the things that I've tried to understand is why it has been so much reviewed and why the system appears to find it so difficult to adapt to technological and other change in an organic way rather than having to come in with primary legislation and reviews again and again. And if you look out ahead and try and guess where we're going, what you would guess is that copyright is going to start affecting things right across the economy in terms of delivery of transport systems, delivery of energy systems, because the control over rights of access to data is part of copyright. And you're convinced that it is part and parcel of innovation, are you? Economically speaking, I mean, economically convinced. Not, I can see you can make all sorts of passionate arguments about it, but you're convinced the economy arguments are there too? Yes, I am convinced about that, and I'm also convinced that intellectual property entitlements in copyright or in patent basically involve the state giving individuals and organisations limited time monopolies over the rights of the things that they've created. It is possible, in fact, there are plenty of examples where you can see how the accumulation of those rights can turn into blockages in the market which are bad for innovation and for growth. And making sure that the whole system is clean and working fluidly is the objective of the exercise. Professor Ian Hargreaves. Now back to Andrew Gowers, who produced another government report on intellectual property only four and a half years ago. I had another sort of question for him. It's very difficult, these different concepts of ownership that come in when you discuss copyright, though, isn't it? Because uh, it was originally devised to help struggling authors in garrets, and that sentimentality, that, or that view of it, still attaches to it in a way, doesn't it? Ownership in a very personal and protective way. Yes, and the people who are often wheeled out as advocates here, and I have sympathy for their case because they're the if you like, the little guy, are, you know, the drummer who played on a recording made in 1963. But I always come back to this point because people do play on these cases. It was never the intention of copyright law, so far as I can tell, to pay the pension of somebody who once played drums on a recording in 1963. Of course, this all sounds very theoretical until you come along to the disruptive effect of the search engines and what some of them want to do with copyrighted and out of copyright material. So this becomes an issue when it was just an academic issue uh, 10 or 15 years ago, doesn't it? It does, but we come back to the fact that it's so much more possible to distribute and redistribute and refashion creations. And I think the object of a modern law system should be to enable both the original creators and new creators to benefit from that flexibility. That means creating a new basis on which these transactions can take place. So So simply saying it should not be possible for Google to digitise books would deny the public some of the benefits of the public good of a free flow of ideas. Simply saying that Google should be able to do it without recourse to the publishers clearly is a denial of some of the publishers' rights. So we have to find a way of expressing that and facilitating that balance to be struck. A delicate balance from Andrew Gowers. The London songwriter and composer Mike Batt has been personally interested in how effectively copyright works for decades. Remember, 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 remember. His song, Remember You're a Womble, was a big British hit back in 1974, and the fur-clad wombles are still turning out for public appearances almost 40 years later. He's also the founder of the independent record label Dramatico and deputy chairman of the industry body, the British Phonographic Industry, the BPI. Mike Batt agrees, of course, that copyright is a very intangible concept, hard to grasp. But for him, it is still a very real right, the right to benefit from what he spent his life creating. You hear music coming across the radio just as you watch watch a film, and you think, oh, it exists, it's lovely, I enjoy it, it's part of my life. But I think people often don't think, well, okay, where did that piece of music come from? Uh, It might have come from someone doing it in their bedroom on a guitar, and it might have cost 
pennies to make it. On the other hand, it could be that I've spent a year writing that piece of music, maybe spent 50 or 60,000 pounds hiring an orchestra to record it, and then in order to get through the crowd, just, just to, not to market it heavily, but just to have it heard, that costs money as well. And people forget that. So there is actually quite a, a substantial investment that is made in music, and that investment can only go on so long as there's a realistic way for us to be rewarded. There's then this battle, isn't there, which comes into the copyright argument, the mental battle about my music, which is now sort of there on your player, and you own it and identified with it, and it's gone through the great moments of your life with you. So you may have written the music, but I've got it on my player. I kind of own it in a very individual sense. People would understand this better if it was about bread. If you could download a loaf of bread, then... You would. And if you could download it for nothing, you would. We would like a song to be regarded as valuable as a loaf of bread so that, you know, you don't just walk into the shop and grab a loaf of bread and walk out again and say, oh, well, there's plenty more bread where that came from. That baker's obviously making a living, so I'll just have a free loaf of bread, thanks very much. It's not like that. Or, or rather, it is like that, and that's the problem. That's what we're sort of worried about, really. Mike Batt, songwriter, musician, creator of what is now called content. But now, hush. It's all quiet because I'm behind the scenes at the British Library, and I'm with Ben White, who knows an awful lot about copyright and how it's changing and the pressures the idea of copyright is under. Because, Ben, you are... I'm Head of Intellectual Property at the British Library. The issue that we face in the UK is the last main raft of legislation was in 1988, which really, well, was before the internet was even... In existence, I think it was in a notebook in Tim Berners-Lee's office. And clearly, everything has changed. And there's also the difference in time scale that copyright applies to all over the place. People play catch-up for a bit, so you have another law in some yes. places. Yeah. That's disarray in a global world, isn't it? It is. For example, in the United States, literary works are in the public domain before 1923, whereas the oldest item that we have that we know is in copyright is from 1865. So this means when you look at large digitization projects, a bit like the Google Books project, you have a situation where American citizens in the States can see an estimated half a million books that in, in Europe are probably in copyright, a large percentage of those are in copyright. So Google actually blocks access in the European Union to an estimated, as I said, 500,000 books. And we think in an era of a knowledge economy, less access to knowledge is not good for innovation, research, education, culture. Ben White at the British Library. Now back to Mark Anderson in Seattle, still working out the impact of the internet on sharing material, somebody's intellectual property, with friends and colleagues all around the world. He says the framework created by the legal concept of copyright still exists, but there's a fast-paced transition happening as very big new players flex their muscles in this traditional world. Apple, I think, tries pretty hard to honor copyright or to honor the wishes of its licensed partners in music and in books. And they just made an announcement that expands the use that users may make by, I think you can have 10 devices now where you buy it once and put it onto 10 different things. So in the world of what's called fair use, where you're allowed to make your own copies, Apple is using business contracts to try to kind of recreate fair use among a maximum number of devices you would probably own in your own life. Two things about that. One, fair use means different things in different places, and Ah, we've just had the (laughs) Hargreaves report in Britain, which has turned down the idea that the American fair use principles should be applied to the way we use copyright material in Britain because it would open up a raft of new legislation all over the place. The other thing about licensing is that surely we're coming to a world where the old principles of copyright are now being eroded by the new contract laws, the supply arrangements that individual companies are making with the people who buy their stuff, and that contract law, it's now argued, is replacing copyright. And that's making it very difficult for people who want to use 
databases in a uniform way, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's becoming a very important part of uh, the economy, people finding cures for new diseases by scanning lots of databases. And they're being blocked from doing that by contract law being in place rather than the old law of copyright. I suspect that we're in a transition time. And what will happen is we will develop digital rights management tools, DRM tools, which will allow these things to happen somewhat transparently. And that will allow us to interact and pay a little more or sign the contract electronically or whatever we have to do to have that access. But the thing you've raised so hard is the security threat. And that is, on this scale, a completely new thing. It's something that I've come to quite slowly because I was looking at it from the economic side instead of the hacker side. But I think that by coming from that side of things, I've come to a deeper understanding of what's happening. And I now look at the global economy in a totally different way. And I see intellectual property as being the most important part of modern economics. And when I look at the flow of intellectual property around the world, no matter how it was obtained, I see that as the leading indicator for where wealth will be created. And so you can imagine how that looks. You know, I mean, that's a radically different way of understanding global economics than the way they teach you in school. Mark Anderson in Seattle, putting intellectual property into a long perspective. For centuries, it's been defended by the laws of copyright and patenting. But now the digital age seems to be putting both those concepts under severe pressure, just when the ideas that make up intellectual property are becoming more economically important than they've ever been before. Peter Day, the producers were Sandra Canthal and Richard Berenger.